Welcome back to Captains of Industry. Still in the studio with me, Mark Kujafani, the CEO of Anglo Gold Ashanti. Mark, now you are a huge advocate in terms of safety when it when it comes to, to mining. And obviously that is another concern with, with miners is that you do have safety concerns and it's yeah. an ongoing issue that you're always going to be dealing with. How do you address the issue? Well, for me, it is always front and centre in terms of anything I've done across three continents. We've won awards for safety performance in my previous life in through Australia, through Canada, five years running and, and in South Africa last year we won Best uh, Improved Major Company. So it's central to every conversation. We have a saying at Anglo Gold Ashanti, people are the business. They're not assets, they're not to be compared to a table or a chair in terms of being assets, they're much more than assets. They're the heart and soul of the company and quite frankly every speech I ever make is about people. Um, because quite frankly the chair and the table don't care. So safety central, we have improved significantly around 65%, still got a long way to go and that's why we're doing so much research and development work in the mines in terms of new mining methods that will take us beyond 5,000 metres safely. So it's all about the technology going forward and innovation at yep. the end of the day. Absolutely. If you look at mining, the type of people that you employ now in your, your management circle, every time I speak to a captain of industry, we speak about the, the kind of people that you surround yourself with because yeah. you're only as good as your people. Correct. What would you say is the number one quality that you look for? Commitment. Commitment, uh, dedication, working with people, but it's all about committed to creating something special, to be a team player and to make sure that we're developing people to be as good as they can be so that everyone has an opportunity to make a contribution. When you say commitment, what is the number one thing that you expect from people? That they are visible at the office? Is it more than that? What would you, how do you define commitment? Leadership is about listening, being with people and ultimately describing a future that they can all buy into and your job is to put the structures and processes in place so they can be all part of that. So commitment is about understanding what we're trying to create as a team and b being part of a team to create that something special which gives every person an opportunity to be part of the game. So it's commitment to people and to making a difference for every individual in the business. And if you were to use one word to describe your leadership style, what would that be? People. Moving on to balancing family now, you have seven children. I don't know if that's a, a widely known fact out there. That's an interesting balancing act that you've got to execute regularly. Well, it's not something I usually advertise because they look at me rather strangely when I say I've got seven. Most usually the second question is, and what's wrong with you? <laughs> yeah, well, so I didn't go that far. I just went, you've got seven children. How do you balance it? Well, uh, um, I have three children living in Australia and we have four children here in South Africa with us. Um, I travel too much. I don't see enough of them. Um, and so uh, their mother has to do the hard work and so she's done a wonderful job and uh, I try and be as supportive as I can. Uh, but it's tough in terms of the commitments we have to make, uh, particularly as we do so much travelling on a global basis. How do you cope with that travelling? Because again, having spoken to a number of captains of industry, video conferencing seems to be a big reality and especially the, the telepresence video conferencing. Yeah. Does that not work for a gold miner? It does, but at the same time, because we're going into so many new jurisdictions and because we're, we're implementing so much change, there's nothing like seeing the leader in person, being able to articulate the key issues that we front and being able to engage people on so a personal face -face level. So it's a face-to-face interaction that you are after. It's absolutely critical, but there's, there's a balance. You, you know, I probably travel more than I should. I could do a lot better with videos, but at the end of the day, being there, being present and being able to respect, react to and respond to people at the time, you know, in real life, is still there is still no substitute. Can you unpack your relationship with Anglo-American, Cynthia Carroll in particular? Well, really, uh, uh, they're another colleague in the industry. We, uh, uh, is we there a lot of face-to-face -face interaction with Cynthia? No, none, none. Mm -hmm. 
uh, other than being a colleague on the ICMM in London uh, once or twice, a, once once a year, and once probably in Barcelona or somewhere else. So not a lot of interaction. We see each other at uh, functions from time to time, uh, but no, not a lot of interaction because they're not a shareholder anymore. So. Uh, uh, when I started, they were about 41% shareholder, and and uh, we helped. Obviously, them. you've migrated that out, so really, you're on your own. Absolutely. Wicked now, effectively. Absolutely. When you look at your growth into new territories, you spoke about it a, a little earlier. Let's talk about Africa. Yep. Your aspirations for the African continent. We've been doing a lot of work there, and I'm very excited about the African story. But each country is a unique challenge with. Not a one-size-fits-all policy. Oh, absolutely. Well, if I said very simply put, in 2008, we our earnings or our EBITDA for the year, and that's cash flow basically from operations, was around a billion dollars US, or about eight billion rand. Today, it's more than three billion dollars, more than 24 billion rand. And we've gone from losing 200 million dollars a year in continental Africa, that's outside South Africa, to actually making more than a billion dollars. So for us, it's been one of the great success stories in our portfolio and has been one of the key drivers of our growth and, and uh, our improvement in operating performance. So very proud of what the guys have done. We're in 11 other countries uh, in Africa and for us, uh, a great place to be. 40% of the world's natural resources are in Africa. And so for us, if you're in mining... That's your growth story. Absolutely. You've got to be in Africa. But we're also growing in South America, the USA, Australia, starting to look at exploration across Asia. We are a global company. We are the most global of the global golds in our space. And uh, within five years, we want to be number one. But with your emerging market growth story, then obviously you come back to that uncertainty theme with regulation and policy and government. It well, weighs on you heavily. But, but, but wherever you are, you have that same uncertainty. Um, the only problem with an Australian jurisdiction is that uncertainty has been removed. It is now certain that they're destroying their industry. At least we've got a chance to influence decision makers in countries like South Africa and in other countries. But we've certainly got a, a much better conversation in many other jurisdictions in Africa. Certainly people aren't talking about super taxes. They're actually trying to encourage investment. So we've been a big investor in the DRC. We're looking at investments in Mali still. We're investing in Ghana. We're investing in Tanzania. We're investing in Guinea. We're investing in When Namibia. you say investing, are you talking about infrastructure Structure rollout in tandem with the mining operations. Absolutely, as well. we, we, we're looking at the whole model in terms of development. So, it, for example, at Mongolu, a new development there, 20 to 30 Excuse percent. Excuse my ignorance, but Mongolu in the DRC. So it's a new project, a new gold mining project. Sorry, a new gold mining project in the DRC. Um, 30 percent of our investment or thereabouts is on is is associated with local infrastructure, roads. Um, communications, energy is all part of the infrastructure that we're creating. So we've learned a lot of lessons. Some of those lessons we've learned in South Africa, how we can do a better job in the local communities and make sure that we become a development company and not an extractive industry company. We're about development and the future of Africa. I want to pause on energy, obviously, with the situations and the problems that we have faced in South Africa. That's going to be a continuing theme and, and probably is a key theme when it comes to mining on the African continent and in other emerging markets. Yeah. What is the solution when you are a gold miner and you need extensive electricity? Well, I think you've got to go into the area and partner with both the government, local communities and think about what the best options are in terms of creating energy solutions. But the one point I would make is instead of just investing in energy for yourself, I think you've got to e invest in energy that supports the development of commercial infrastructure in the region so that the majority of people can really see the impact, the positive impact that you make. So for example, in Seguri in Guinea, we actually run the local power station for the government because they didn't have the skills and expertise. We took it over. The local community has power. We're running the local hospital. So we are providing the social glue and infrastructure that makes that community work. And ultimately, I think in our industry, particularly through Africa, we've got to be part of infrastructure solutions. And in fact, the concept I've been promoting is establishing infrastructure hubs around Africa and agreeing with governments and people who are investing in 
um, people centres or major cities or tourist centres that between the mining industry, the tourist industry and the population centres we should be thinking about creating infrastructure hubs and investing in road networks so that when we invest in our mine and we're developing energy, we build roads and other infrastructure, the local agricultural sector can piggyback on the roads that we've created to get their grain or product to another market much much cheaper. And so we become the catalyst for a whole range of other industry uh, developments to occur in that particular region. So in Africa, if we can get governments, the mining industry and other providers of capital to start linking in terms of a strategic plan, we will build the infrastructure necessary for Africa if to grow and become the most dynamic continent in the next 25 years. Are you finding it easy to have those conversations? No. Are people embracing? No. 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 I, it's hard to, it's easy to land the point, but who do you talk to in terms of creating a much broader strategy for Africa is a much tougher conversation because many of the politicians, more so South Africa, are used to dealing with a chamber. Well, it's very difficult for a chamber to articulate a specific vision of one company or another. They have to engage in both the chamber and individual companies who have the willingness and the financial horsepower to put those things in place. So we have to engage in a whole range of players as we have to engage. Do you try and facilitate those conversations yourself? Absolutely. That's what we're trying to do now, doing more and more of that both through the chamber both as individually as a company, with other companies, with other financial providers, with the George Soros who's working in Guinea looking at uh, helping the government renegotiate its mining packs with its um, investor companies. We try and do that on a range of fronts with, with the, the president of the DRC where we're in direct dialogue, in Ghana, in those countries. So we try and facilitate those conversations where we are, with, do, with the World Economic Forum, with the United Nations. Wherever we can see people that may be able to influence a conversation, we'll have that conversation. We've spoken about a number of challenges that you face on a, on a regular basis and you've said you really need to cope with all of those issues because that is the nature of mining. I don't want to ask you something but that, that is out of place, but often we say, well, what keeps you awake at night? If you take all your challenges, is it a little bit of each challenge that keeps you awake or is there one particular challenge? I could throw a guess at regulation being a key concern. Well, actually, the thing that, you know, in terms of regulation and those debates, those are the things we can engage in in change. And in my view, when I said 11.5% GDP, 21%, 45%, we drive the world's economy, the amount of politicians that have come back and said that can't be right. What even shocks them more is when I tell them that mining only takes up 1% of the Earth's surface, it, takes, it uses less than 1% of the world's water, and it generates less than 3% of the world's climate change gases. And the products are more important in terms of environmental sustainability than any other industry in the world. Most important industrial activity known to man with the smallest environmental footprint. We are absolutely critical. But what we've got to do is sell the story, we've got to engage, and we've got to tell people how we can make a difference. And I think we've got to do a much better job of it. Mark, you speak passionately about the gold mining industry, so it's fair to assume you are here, sir, for a long time to come. I hope so. <laughs> Thank you very much for your time. Well, we've come to the end of this week's edition of Captains of Industry. Until next time, it's goodbye and thank you for watching.